welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. So today, uh, I was thinking I was going to pick your brain about pedophilia and specifically maybe forensic pedophilia. Mm -hmm. I think there's been an increased interest in the, in the news. Um, you may have seen the hashtag save, save the children yes, and other things. And there was a recent movie cuties, which I'm going to be doing, a, a dialogue with some other, with, uh, some other psychiatrists on, mm -hmm. but I yes. think, yes, indeed about the sexualization of children in our society. Yeah. Yeah, it's very disturbing to me. I actually canceled my Netflix. I put it up on uh, my social media that I was doing that, and I got a bunch of mostly mostly positive, but some feedback that was like, you know, disagreeing. A lot of the a lot of the arguments, interestingly, were like, were like, well, why are you so upset at this when there's so many other things going on in our culture that sexualizes children? And I was like, yeah, I think all of that is bad. <laughs> I think we yes. should. I think we should pro probably should not do that at all. And I'm on here actually. Uh, Maddie Ulrich is joining me. She's a medical student Hello. who's been hanging out with me for a week working on this. Hi. Hello. I promised I wouldn't have her do one month of pedophilia <laughs> and the like. <laughs> so, yeah, where do you want to start with this? You want to maybe go through some of the history of forensic pedophilia? I know you're an expert because you work at. Patton State Hospital, you guys have a, how many, you guys have a ward, right? Uh, we do. We have a unit that's devoted to treatment of what are, in, are termed in California sex, sex offenders or sexually violent predators, uh, which has a legal definition. Uh, one of the chief groups, however, among those individuals are, are indeed uh, individuals who are pedophilic. Uh, in terms of history, the concept really of, well, first childhood and then a division between childhood and adulthood really began to crystallize, not surprisingly, until the 19th century. And of course, in many cultures, marriage often followed puberty by not very much. However, over time, that became less common and it became more uh, socially acceptable for people to get married at later ages. And that certainly, that trend has uh, continued. People now often delay marriage into their 20s or 30s uh, if they're going to get married. And also, in many cases, delay their sexual activity as well. Um, one of the interesting things about the paraphilias in general is, um, despite having been a topic of interest for literally millennia, we still don't understand very much about how people become attracted uh, sexually to the people they're attracted to. You know, and this includes both normal attraction and paraphilic or abnormal attraction. Because what people find attractive develops very early in life through a myriad of exposures. Indeed, most individuals can't tell you why they like tall people or short people or blonde people or dark haired people. And indeed, the people who develop paraphilias often have a very hard time describing how they became paraphilic, although it's clear it starts fairly early. Uh, most of the pedophiles that I've interviewed and talked to began experiencing fantasies or urges directed toward inappropriately young partners at a fairly er early age, often around 11 or 12, right around the age of puberty. And often their interests centered on either people their own age or not uncommonly people even younger than they were. And then that continued to evolve often with 
a lot of fantasies and these days fed by um, a fairly active pornography industry until they uh, eventually begin to act on those fantasies and urges, which is how it gets to be forensic pedophilia, meaning they ultimately become arrested uh, for pedophilic behaviors and activities, although most police departments and criminal organizations, uh, crime fighting organizations will tell you that the vast majority of uh, pedophilic involvements go undiscovered and unpunished. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, uh, the number for true pedophiles, the number of victims is often in the hundreds, which is often what ultimately gets them caught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These and you know, so it, it's one of the most common of the paraphilias. Frankly, the the law, for the most part, does not care about paraphilias that involve a consenting adult partner. Mm -hmm. However, those that uh, that are proscribed or prohibited by the law are those that involve lack of consent, either the person who is paraphilic in terms of coerced or involuntary sex, sexual sadism, that's not voluntary, or uh, pedophilia in which the person lacks the legal capacity to give consent. Other paraphilias are typically not legally prohibited, at least in the United States. They are in some portions of the world. Mm. Yeah, I um, I don't know if you heard of this uh, this story about Helm Mutt Kentler. Yes, who was a uh, who was a psychology professor and started in the 1970s placing homeless children in West Bor West Berlin with known pedophilic men. Um, mm -hmm. And this and this continued for some years. Um, the study went on for 30 years and um, was officially approved and supported by Berlin's Child Welfare, Welfare Offices and Senate. There's been a big investi- or, I don't know, a, an investigation on how this was allowed to continue. But at the time, you know, he said, oh, this is not hurting the children. This is helping the children. You know, finally, that the children have someone that loves them, that's taking care of them. And um, some some victims have come out and are fighting for reparations because, you know, they were abused and yes. um, they suffered psychological consequences. And what's crazy when I hear this story is like, this was going on not too long ago, you know? Like yes. This, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this particular story. That particular story indeed was a good example of um, what amounted to um, official governmental abrogation of its duty to protect its citizens, in this case, its younger citizens. This is an area that, frankly, the law has not dealt very well with and at times not very effectively with. Um, for example, there are still states in the United States where, with parental consent, the legal age of marriage is 14. And certainly in some strata of society, we have the recent uh, Jeffrey Epstein case where mm -hmm. recruitment and um, provision of underage women uh, for sexual contact was went on for decades and was, uh, at least in the initial case in Florida, was essentially not punished. Uh, mm -hmm. He was convicted. However, all of his illicit activity led to, I believe, a 10-month sentence with his being able to serve the sentence only on the weekends and go home at night. I, th I think he had, to, he had to sleep there, but he was allowed to leave during the day. He was yes. allowed to pay um, an officer to accompany him wherever he went on business trips or whatnot, but he was you know, often left without supervision during that time. It's, mm -hmm. when, when I... I, when I watched that documentary, I, I literally could not sleep well. 
I mean, I slept a little bit, but you know, like it, it, it's, it was torturesome to watch. Yes. It was, I, I imagine like yourself having, having a daughter, me having a daughter. It's like, that's, this is just horrible. And yes, the fact that he was able to get away with it for years, that's very disturbing yeah, it was, to me. Yeah, was inexcusable. Uh, in his case, it was an example of uh, wealth can provide a lot of protection against legal intervention. Wealth and and uh, political allies. Yes, I would I would assume because you know at some point money isn't going to stop the law, but. Uh, only if the money has indeed promoted um, political connections, if you will. Yeah. You know, this is an area in which the law, though, has not, you know, the egregious cases of what are clear examples of sexual victimization, uh, the pedophile who kidnaps, injures, or kills children in addition to having sex with them, clearly violates the law and uh, those people do wind up usually either being punished and or given very long-term commitments in places like state hospitals the law deals less elegantly with people who are in other circumstances for example an 18 year old boy who is dating a 16 year old girl if they have sex it is not legal on the other hand um, it's not typically punished and frankly it makes news when it is punished because it's a more acceptable social norm yeah. uh, in California we uh, the law because the law has to make definitive law in some places sexual contact with a child under the age of 14 is fairly vigorously punished. Between 14 and 18, however, it is called unlawful sex, and indeed it is illegal, but may not be nearly as stringently punished. And then, of course, on the day the person becomes 18, they also become legally able to consent to sexual activity with anyone who is also 18 or over. Yeah, and there was a recent law change in that, which um, I think it has allowed a 14-year-old to have sex with someone who's 10 years older, mm -hmm. like a 24-year-old, which, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's people on both, side of, both sides of that, you know, wanting yeah. or not wanting well, when it. I, well, I think, I think where the law struggles with this is clearly if you have two 16-year-olds, for example, one may indeed be very much a child and not have emotionally and socially progressed very far. On the other hand, some 16-year-olds are much more mature. But, you know, you can't, um, the law basically can't deal very well with ind indefinite things like, well, how mature is the person? Mm -hmm. How able are they to make those decisions? We also have, we were, t we're t uh, me and... Um... Maddie, we're talking about how in TV shows now, like Riverdale, <laughs> you'll have these teenagers hooking up all the time. What, mm -hmm. and, but what were you saying about that, Maddie? Oh, yeah. On the show, they – well, there's a lot of things about the show. But on the show, the main characters have sex with each other like all the time. And that's just not usually very realistic of what teenagers do. Like most of them don't have sex every day. Most of them might not even think about it or like have the opportunity to, especially because they still live with their parents and things like that. But on the show, they do it all the time in their parents' homes. Their parents are like never there. And it's just like, I feel like it shows teenagers like an unrealistic depiction of what they should be doing at that age. It does. And while our society also, uh, as you pointed out originally with the, uh, movie cuties and other examples has tended to sexualize very young individuals um, and continues to do so, which I think gives an unrealistic and in some ways permissive view of underage sex. I mean, I can't tell you how many of the pedophiles that I've interviewed point out correctly 
that um, a huge percentage of the both the non-pornographic and, frankly, pornographic films and film clips out there depict sex between older people and younger people. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and to a great extent, tend to normalize that sexual interaction. And I, indeed, I've had more than one of them tell me, well, in many ways, I was only following what society is already endorsing. Hmm. Oh, that's uh, uh, I was talking to um, someone, and they were saying that at Patton, you wouldn't be able to stop the pedophilia unit from watching something like Cuties because it is on Netflix. Mm. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Because it would not... Uh, well, basically, we also, uh, by law, we cannot prevent, for example, a pedophilic, or for that matter, any patient, from receiving and viewing pornographic material as long as it is not material that directly violates the law. Because that would be a, a, an infringement of their First Amendment rights. Hmm. So kind of getting back to the, uh, the diagnosis of, of pedophilia, I think it's also, it, I, I, and the prevalence, I'm wondering like what percent actually are physically abusing children, watching pornography, which I think is in a sense abuse because someone had to be abused to watch child pornography, um, versus what percent are abstaining not, you know, trying to resist these sort of desires, you know, yeah. and try to move out of it. The sh well, the short answer is we don't have very good numbers because obviously most people who are pedophiles don't go around saying that they're pedophilic, uh, given that the vast majority of them have not been arrested. Interesting, uh, a few surveys done in colleges have asked the question of male undergraduate students, how many of you would have sex with an underage girl if you knew absolutely for certain that you could get away with it and there would not be any punishment? And the answer has typically been about 50%. Yeah. Is that under age, under 18 or under 14? You know, like under 18. In other right. words, under the legal yeah. age of consent. I mean, do you differentiate between like wanting sex with someone who's not gone through puberty with someone who has gone through puberty? Like, how do you make that different? Yes. yes. Differentiation. Uh, one of the one of the things that's come out of the research in this area is that clearly people who desire to have sex with pre-pubertal individuals are psychologically much more abnormal, much more likely to be, if you will, compulsive about their sexual desires and much more likely to be violent than people who are attracted to individuals who are underage, meaning under the illegal age of consent, but are clearly post-pubertal. Yeah. That is, they resemble they more closely physically resemble adults. And indeed, one of the, uh, one of the elements of interview f in, in dealing with any pedophilic individual is to ask them uh, about the content of their fantasy and urges, including, you know, what would be the gender and sex and appearance of their most desirable victim. Hmm the more closely that victim resembles an age-appropriate partner, typically the less pathologic the person's paraphilia is. And as you might guess, it's kind of a progression because obviously people change from the point of puberty to the point of adulthood and become progressively more adult in terms of mental and emotional capacities as well as in terms of physical appearance. Yeah. That frontal lobe keeps developing, right? In us until the age of what, 32, somewhere around there, like the, the pruning going on uh, somewhere around there. Now, now, uh, frankly, uh, as you know, 
women's brains mature faster than males. And indeed, there are women who would opine that some males never quite make it to the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Especially if there's some traumatic brain injuries in the process or some... Uh, yes. A lot of alcohol, drugs. Um, so t- t- let's talk specifically about that, the, the person who's attracted to the, the prepubescent person. You said that they're psychologically different. Yes. Uh, it, the, the psychological differences that have been found is that it is less often a pure sexual attraction, although that's certainly a major element, but that seems to be fused with um, elements of desiring power, control over the partner. Mm-hmm. In other words, they're specifically picking a partner who is less physically large, less emotionally capable, less intellectually capable. Uh, So often their fantasies run to elements of control and coercion, much more so than the person who picks a partner who may be underage, but who is much more adult in terms of characteristics. Um, Wow, that's interesting, yeah. There's also, in now that's one profile. Another profile that often comes into play with picking very young victims is that many of the pedophiles who tend to pick very young victims are themselves both emotionally and very oftentimes very intellectually immature. Yeah, yeah. I was watching some of the, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, it's, it's like Pedophile Hunter. Yes. on YouTube. And, um, this guy pretends to be, you know, a young victim and then meets this pedophile. Right. And then like forces them to do an interview and they, they seem very underdeveloped often, often mm-hmm. these, the, the people who are chasing these super young girls and boys. Yeah. They're often themselves emotionally, very immature. Um, and indeed, They've often, the ones I've interviewed have been very unsuccessful in attempting to establish adult intimate relationships because, frankly, mature adults uh, are not interested in them because they are immature. I was looking at this, uh, the penile plasmography. Yes. Plasmography. And, um, do you guys use this at all at, at uh, Patton, or is it mostly a research tool? Yes, we tool? do. It, it, no, it is used clinically as well. It's, uh, it's used here. It's also used at uh, uh, Department of State Hospitals, Coalinga. Uh, Coalinga is actually where the vast majority of people who have been legally declared to be sexually violent predators are housed in the state hospital system. The SVP law, which is Welfare and Institutions Code Section 6600 and onward, has as its requirements that the person has engaged in establishing relationships essentially for the purpose of sexual victimization. Mm -hmm. They have then engaged in sexually violent acts, and the, the law actually specifies a list of crimes. They have to also then suffer from a mental disorder. Any disorder can qualify, but certainly paraphilias are high on the list. And then the the mental disorder has to make it more likely than than not that they will pursue further victims, if you will. Hmm. Uh, And for California, that's a sexually violent predator. They're committed post their prison term for two years, but that two-year commitment can be renewed indefinitely as long as they continue to pose a risk. The plasmatography is used to judge basically their response to treatment. It's done basically with a series of computer images of uh, people who are clearly adults, younger people, and basically um, the measurement is how too messant do they become looking at different sorts of images. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's also uh, a parallel test that's used that was developed by a, um, a psychiatrist named Gene Abel in which the computer randomly shows the individual a series of images, some children, some adults, various levels of dress or undress. And the computer keeps track of just how long the person looks at each image. Mm. Uh, and of course, computers are very good at measuring time down to the millisecond. Mm. And over several hundred images, yep. uh, it can identify whether there's a pattern or whether it's just random. You know, um, Instagram is pretty good at that too. Yes. <laughs> um, I was talking to one patient and she like grabbed, was looking at this guy's Instagram and from just looking at his feed could tell what kind of girls he was into mm -hmm. because, you know, after a while it, the, the algorithm kind of shows that. So let me ask you a question. So I, I read this article by Moeller. It was called changes in sexual arousal as measured by penile plasmography in men with pedophilic sexual interest. And the article sort of tried to counter, counter this, this thought that you're basically stuck with only having interest in children. If you have interest in children, um, this, this study showed that there was a group that changed over time and had a huge increase in the interest or the, you know, increase in the size of the penis with watching adult arousing content over time. Do you, yes. have, do you have any thoughts on this? You're probably much more um, an expert yeah. on this than I am. Yeah. And, in, and indeed, uh, that's one of the things that our clinicians are looking for as they've worked in um, therapy with these individuals to try to uh, essentially help them develop a healthier arousal pattern, if you will. And then, of course, they use the penile plasmography and the gene-able image test to track shifts in the person's arousal response. Because, you know, a, a sexual arousal really begins subcortically, so it's not something that we can consciously control. Um, there have been a number of uh, event-related uh, EEG studies that show that if an individual finds something sexually interesting, that there is an increase in the P50 wave, which is way subcortical, way before you become consciously aware of it. And those sorts of measures and, you know, these tests are not, sort of one and done, they're, they're used repeatedly across therapy to essentially provide an objective measure of whether the person's interests are changing over time. Mm. One of the conundrums that legally we have is that for sex offenders, the bar to be released into the community is incredibly high. Uh, essentially zero failure. Well, that's almost impossible, uh, which is why only a tiny handful of people have ever been released from Koalinga, even though in many cases they've made a good deal of psychological and developmental progress, but you can't guarantee to the public they will never reoffend. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of difference between obviously the the very predatory uh, pedophile with hundreds of victims who's essentially a hunter. That person likely should remain locked up forever versus the person who may not have been a dedicated pedophile but may have had difficulty with impulse control sometimes as a result of drugs or alcohol. We see a number of cases like that occur, for example, within families where there's been one victim, hmm. you know, uh, a, for example, a near but not quite adult cousin or 
some other relative or somebody with whom it was inappropriate for them to have sexual contact, but there was not really an established predatory pattern. Or in some cases, people who simply engaged in inappropriate sexual behavior as a direct outgrowth, not of a paraphilia, but of another mental disorder like schizophrenia or bipolar mood disorder, manic. Mm -hmm. uh, those individuals, we have a, a much better track record of being able to eventually release into the community as safe because in essence, they're not the hardcore pedophiles. They engaged in pedophilic behavior, but they didn't really establish uh, the pattern I was talking about earlier. People who begin having fantasies and urges in around puberty go on to develop and rehearse those mentally. And then eventually it spills over into behavior and they become long-term pedophilic predators. Those people, frankly, we have not discovered a great way to improve their development to the point where they no longer pose a danger. Mm -hmm. um, like the more psychopathic. Yeah, the more psychopathic and indeed the, the individuals who are both pedophilic and psychopathic are even very difficult even with um, the testing that we have available to tell whether they've made progress or not because psychopaths are very good at well, not very good at, actually their biological substrate is, of course, not having much of an affective response. Mm -hmm. And of course, the penile tumescence and the ABLE test are both highly responsive to the response of the limbic system. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you about the sort of the comorbidity of, of psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder with this group of, with this population. Yeah. Uh, for the people who are the true predators, if you will, there is a very high rate of comorbidity with psychopathy. Yeah. In, in part because of course, psychopaths don't typically have a rather callous disregard for the welfare of others. So it doesn't, bother them very much to victimize children. Whereas the pedophiles who are not psychopaths are themselves often quite tortured by their sexual urges. Yeah. I think it's really good to differentiate like OCD with sort of unwanted pedophilic like um, thoughts. I've had a couple of those cases in in those cases, like, you know, they also might have hand washing or some sort of other obsession and then or mm -hmm. and compulsion. Like the the obsession being, you know, I feel dirty, okay, compulsion, I'm gonna wash my hands and they you know, but I, I think that in that population, I sometimes once I get build that therapeutic alliance enough, we'll ask them if they have any unwanted sexual thoughts. And those are some of the most distressing for someone yes. with O C D. Um, yeah, it, whereas indeed those people virtually never act on their obsessional thoughts, you know, whether they be, because uh, indeed you'll see uh, obsessional, intrusive, unwanted sexual thoughts, unwanted violent thoughts. These people, however, are not really at risk of acting on those. Mm -hmm. Their compulsions are uh, truly punishing for them and drive them to the compulsive behaviors to try to alleviate the anxiety induced by the thoughts and the thought content. But I, you know, to, um, to bring us back to the, the forensic population, uh, I have never met a, uh, an obsessive compulsive disorder patient who was a sexual predator or sex offender. I've also seen a schizophrenic patient, uh, he was having auditory hallucinations that he should, or that he'd had molested his uh, cousin. And it, it, it was so intense that he, he actually went to the police station and told them he was having these thoughts. He wasn't having the thoughts you know, or it didn't happen. Right. But he was, he was yes. hearing things and, and he, he was paranoid around this sort of topic. So 
Yeah, I don't know if you've seen that before. Probably not as uh, much in the forensic area, though, right? Uh, we have occasionally seen it, and we've actually had people who, with psychosis, who did behave sexually inappropriately in response to delusional ideation. I've never seen one of those individuals who was truly pedophilic. It had more to do with loss of um, loss of reality testing, loss of boundaries. And, and, you know, why did you do that? Well, the voice told me to, you know, the voice told me if I didn't do this, the world would end that kind of thing. In some ways, almost a more psychotic version of what you get from the obsessive compulsive disorder patients. The other category of people we get sometimes who've done things that are very sexually inappropriate, but not really a reflection of paraphilia, uh, have been in some of our elderly demented patients. Mm -hmm. Like the the frontal temporal dementias, especially yes. I imagine, you know, so they're missing that sort of gait. Yes, they're missing uh, the ability to make social judgments or to impair impulses. And often it gets them in trouble. You, uh, usually it's not the same sort of sexual behavior you see with the paraphilic individuals, usually it's, uh, usually they wind up here as a result of sexual battery, inappropriate touching. Mm. They'll see somebody who's in a, who's attractive, have no impulse control and basically reach out and touch the person inappropriately, but it's not having sex with the individual per se. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it with uh, drugs and alcohol, specifically methamphetamines seems to be the drug where I've seen people change their sexual interest starkly. Yes. Well, in part that's because the, the medial amygdala, which uh, is really where, um, if you will, the heart of sex drive is in human beings is in part driven by dopamine. That's one of the reasons, for example, in Parkinson's patients, sometimes treatment with dopamine agonists or cinemat L-dopa, Carbidopa will cause them to exhibit very inappropriate sexual behavior, even though that was not prior to the medication exposure, something that was part of their history. Hmm. That's a good little pearl. Watch out for that. And I think it's important to know that that could happen because often there'll be so much shame around that as a that the family won't tell you or the patient won't tell you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, for example, we've had a, a patient here who, unfortunately, as soon as you gave him enough levodopa carbidopa to control his bradykinesia and his cogwheel rigidity, he also would become a thoroughgoing exhibitionist. Uh, if you lowered the dose of L-dopa, carbidopa, all of the inappropriate sexual behavior would just vanish, which, of course, is a clinical conundrum because uh, on one hand, you don't want to leave the man rigid and unable to move. On the other hand, you don't want him uh, you know, engaging in inappropriate sexual exposure. Yep, yep, that's tough. Maddie, why don't you ask some of the questions you have written yeah. down here? So after researching this topic a lot this week, I had a few questions that came up. Sure. Um, so kind of going back to what you said about how sexual drive starts at like a subconscious level, do you think that pedophilia is ever a choice? Because that's something that comes up a lot in the media. Or is it something like, is, is it something that I, can control at all? I, well, let me, uh, let me break that question down. Is having pedophilic interests a choice no um we don't understand how we come to be attracted to what we find attractive it would be the same as asking a question who's attracted to brunettes of the opposite gender who are tall do you have a choice about being attracted to those people probably not uh, those choices became ingrained 
not as a series of conscious choices, but as of unconscious or subconscious conditioning. Uh, do you have a choice about what you do with those or any other sexual urges? The answer is yes. Uh, and that's, that's one of the principal elements of treating people with paraphilia is to help clarify for them. They may not have a choice about having pedophilic urges, but they do clearly have a choice about whether they act on them or not. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I would, um, I would add one caveat and I would be interested in your thoughts on this. I think that we have a choice on how we can change our environment. And this kind of goes with like, if we act upon, you know, impulses maybe to watch pornography, it'll probably strengthen or change our interest in sexual things over time, depending on what pornography we watch. Especially, yes. the, especially if it's if it's done earlier in life. Just like you know, I I had a patient who ended up in an abusive relationship where sex was always done with violence, and she got out, and she was a you know patient of mine about two years after the relationship was over, and she's like, I don't know what happened in the relationship, but the only thing, like for some reason, ar what's arousing to me is some form of violence mixed with sex. Mm -hmm. And so it was like not there before the relationship, but then the pattern and the repetition over time changed things. So I wonder if you would agree with the, the, the statement that you have the choice to change the environment that potentially could change some of the unconscious things that are going on, but that may take time. It may be very difficult and um, it may not be 100%. Indeed, that's also an element. You probably don't have a choice about having the initial pedophilic urges. You do have choices about whether you choose to reinforce those, avoid reinforcing those, acting on them, not acting on them. Um, to give you a, a more mundane parallel example, for you know, if you know, uh, for example, that you are prone to alcohol abuse, perhaps not hanging out at the local bar would be a good choice. Yeah, we, uh, we were looking at this one pedophilia website where they were, there was a group of people who were committing to being abstinent. And one thing that they were put in their sort of rules is that you won't be alone in a room with a child. Yeah, it's yes. called virtuouspedophiles.org. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and indeed, they're, uh, they're a good example of the people, the people who are members of that group, indeed, are those individuals who are not psychopaths. They're the individuals who indeed have pedophilic urges and orientation, but they are troubled by them. They don't wish to victimize children, and consequently, they indeed, just like the people who joined Alcoholics Anonymous and don't want to drink, I found a variety of things they can do that will help them avoid that role. You know, again, coming back to the issue of you may not have a choice about having had the initial urges, but you do have choices about how you manage them uh, over time, yeah. including, as you point out, things like environment. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things about the underlying choices is. Um, you know, all of us, obviously, if there weren't sex, we wouldn't have a species. And consequently, we're very hardwired to be interested in sex. If you go back to the EEG studies with the P50 wave, which is very early, it's, this is subcortical processing. If somebody shows up that meets your profile, and they did this in Scandinavia, they had the person start off very heavily dressed, and then they had them gradually remove clothing, not to the point where they were naked, but where they were much more skimpily dressed. Uh, the less dressed the target became, the higher the amplitude of the P50 wave became. Uh, now, which, is, which is why we should keep the uh, clothes on the children mm -hmm. when they're dancing, yes. for goodness sakes. Um, uh, now, one of the interesting things in that study was they found that 
men responded to women that they found attractive, women responded to both men and women, and they puzzled over that for a while. And then they figured the women may be looking at potential competition, hmm. which is because the P50 wave essentially is a is a reflection of um, the anterior cingulate gyrus saying, oh, this is worth paying attention to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, read the next one. Yeah. So um, one of the studies I found that was done in 2002, they just compared around 20 men with pedophilia to some that didn't have it. And they said that 60% of the pedophiles compared with only 4% of the controls reported sexual advances as a child. And then on top of that, 75% of the pedophiles compared to only 22% of the control reported a first sexual encounter before they were 14. So in, in your experience, have you noticed that a history of child abuse, does it influence whether or not you have pedophilia? Yes. Uh, more specifically, there have been a number of studies that have found that the earlier the individual becomes sexualized, the more likely it is they will choose inappropriately young partners. Mm. And that may have to do with, you know, uh, for all of us, you know, early or first sexual experiences are often very emotionally powerful. And the, if those occur at an inappropriately young age, there seems to be then a fixation with wanting to go back and repeat that. And of course, you know, once you're older, you can't actually regress to that age, but you can pick partners who are, the, who are of that mm -hmm. age. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about treatment from your perspective. Now that you're, you're at an inpatient setting, do you guys use like SSRIs, like high dose to decrease libido or do you use anti-testosterone treatment? Uh, we do use both. Uh, as you know, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors do, in many people, decrease arousal and certainly delay orgasm, often cause anorgasmia, uh, which for some people can be a help uh, in terms of not reinforcing their sexual urges. The anti-androgens, uh, most commonly Depo-Provera, or luprolide are also used to decrease circulating testosterone levels, usually by about 75 to 100 percent, which correspondingly decrease sex drive. What What is your goal when you're doing like luprolide? Like how much, what percent decrease are you guys looking for? Are you looking for total testosterone decrease or no, free testosterone? Op optimally, the way uh, it's done most correctly is to get a baseline measurement of testosterone and then to aim for about a 75% reduction from baseline. For most people, that will substantially reduce the intensity of their sex drive without making them very liable to the primary long-term adverse effect of testosterone inhibition, which is bone demineralization. And indeed, one of the follow-ups for anybody on anti-androgen treatment is to be sure that we do annual bone density. Hmm. Any other, um, like for providers who are actually considering treating with luprolide, um, any other clinical pearls or things that they should know? Um, probably the, the, the attractive thing about luprolide, um, well, two things. It comes, of course, in a uh, monthly injection, a quarterly injection, and a six-month injection. Uh, so for those people who, for whom this is a chronic problem, obviously the longer half-life, longer dose interval may be desirable. The other element to know about is this is a gonadotropin-releasing hormone analog. So for the first two weeks after the initial injection, there will actually be an increase in testosterone, and there may be an actual increase in sex drive and sex behavior uh, that will then decline over time. 
Oh, that's really, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the Depo Provera? Anything with that that people should consider? Uh, Depo Provera is uh, used less often these days, mostly because unlike the Luprolide, it poses a much greater risk of causing um, hepatitis. Depo-Provera can cause inflammation of the liver. It's not a very frequent outcome, but because Depo-Provera uh, medroxyprogesterone is given much more frequently for suppression of testosterone than, for example, than for example when it's used uh, to provide contraception there's a higher risk because you're using much higher doses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Any other big questions you wanted to get off? Maybe we have one time for one more. Yeah. One thing that I just wanted to ask, especially for psychiatrists, how should we view pedophiles in general? And then what should we try to promote to the public about them? Um, it's important to, I think, in looking at pedophiles, uh, well, for that matter, with all of the paraphilic disorders, to essentially go a bit further and try to characterize them in terms of if you have contact with them, are you looking at a person who has engaged in pedophilic behavior as part of a predatory pattern or is this somebody who is in one of the other categories, such as pedophilic behavior that's a result of another mental disorder like mania mm -hmm. or intoxication? Uh, the ones who are not predatory are much better treatment candidates in terms of having lower inherent risk. The predatory ones are going to be much more difficult to treat and remain much more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And if you were a therapist, what would you recommend if someone came in who was wanting to be abstinent, not wanting to watch porn or be in a relationship? Like what would, what would you say are some of the things that they could do to help themselves? Um, one, uh, as you pointed out, there are support groups available mm. just as there are for substance abuse. Uh, and in joining and being active in one of those groups is a very large help. The dominant form of psychotherapy for paraphilias is uh, our modified versions of cognitive behavioral therapy, typically done in groups. The group therapies tend to be more effective than individual therapy, hmm. Hmm. Uh, in large part because just as in substance abuse disorders, Pedophiles are much better at calling each other out and keeping each other honest than therapists are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, and consequently that, you know, I'd be looking at, you know, and certainly for anybody in, in practice, one of the responsibilities I think for any individual therapist is wherever you practice, become familiar with the resources in your area, including groups that deal with things like pedophilia. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cummings, for coming on. I think this is an important topic to discuss at this time. Any final pearls or reflections that you would want people to walk away with from this discussion? I, you know, uh, this is an area in which our treatments are still fairly limited. There has been progress. You know, I think as a society, our own attitudes and responsiveness and responsibilities, frankly, with respect to sexuality in general, need to mature. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, I think some of the pedophiles I talk with are right. Their own uh, sort of titillation with inappropriate sexual behavior is too much reinforced yeah. by our society. Yeah. Well, I feel very strongly about that too. I think just because what wires together fires together, right? And yes. I think that our brain lights up, you know, it's it's like why do beer commercials have beautiful women standing in a bar next to a guy drinking a beer? 
you know, it's because they're trying to pair the two things, right? Yes. Um, drinking a beer, which, you know, prior to the pairing probably doesn't have very much sexual s stimulating things, um, although it can reduce some sort of maybe um, inhibitions a little bit. But it's the pairing over time that you start to associate two things together. And my concern is, you know, if you look at a lot of music videos, they pair either very young females with sexuality or they're pairing sexuality with violence often, um, going back and forth between violent scenes and sexual scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pairing things that potentially can be harmful and doing it on a very sort of subconscious, unconscious level. Like you said before, yeah. a lot of this stuff develops. Yeah, um, indeed. We might do better if we uh, actually spend some effort toward pairing uh, more adult appropriate intimacy with entertainment rather than inappropriate things. Very good. Well, Dr. Cummings, thank you for coming on. And uh, once again, I'm really thankful for for you and i know the people who listen to this are so you know it's great to put your brain out there and your thoughts and your uh, expertise <laughs> well, well as long as you give it back at the end i'm okay <laughs> yeah all right take care okay thanks bye-bye <laughs>